All right, welcome everybody. I got another Godwin for you today. So today's message is the at one minute. And then the subtitle is, When Would Now Be a Good Time? So, who has ever had an extra, extraordinary moment in time that was so amazing that you hoped it would never end? Anybody ever had one of those moments before? Awesome, great. You got, you had, did you have it? Everybody? Is that? Okay, great. Thank you. So, who would love for every moment to be like that moment? Say, I. Awesome, thank you. That's what today is all about. Everybody say, this is the at one mint. Thank you. Everyone say, when would now be a good time? Thank you. Everyone say, now is the time. Thank you. Everyone say, this is my moment. Thank you. Everyone say, this is my atonement. All right. Y'all ready to, ready to get rock and roll? All right. So there's a difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. Okay, there's a difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. I really want this. I really want that. I really want that. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that's great. But there's a difference between wanting it. What was it? Uh, your mama probably told you uh, want, want in one hand and shit in the other and see which one fills up first. Or is that just my mom? Or maybe it was my friend's mom. Maybe it wasn't even my mom. Feels like a, it feels like somebody's mom said that. I think it was my friend's mom. Yeah, it was definitely my, yeah, it was my best friend's mom. <laughs> yeah. Shit in one hand and wish in the other. See which one fills up fastest. <laughs> so, you don't get what you want or deserve. You get what you focus on. And so there's a difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. If you get something that you want before you're ready to receive it, either you're going to destroy it or it's going to destroy you. So, thank God you don't get something before you're ready to receive it. Now, here's where it gets uh, really cool about there's a difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. How you know you're ready to receive it is when you realize that it's here now, it always has been, and it always will be. Until you get there, you know for sure that you are not ready to receive it because you're still yearning for something that is not even not present, but you perceive it to not be. And we leave what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. So whatever it is that you think that you're waiting for, that thing doesn't even exist. It's, it's a nothing, and you're leaving everything for a nothing. You've, you've compartmentalized, because the reason you're wanting the thing, you don't actually want the thing. You want, you want what you think the thing is going to give you. You don't want money. You want the, the freedom or, or the ability to buy the things that you think will make you happy. So it's either you want freedom or you want happiness or you want something. That's, it's, that's what you want the thing for. You don't want a relationship. You want what you think the relationship is going to give you. You don't want a home. You want what you think the home is going to give you. And so all those things, those are just packages. All the things that you think that you want, those are just conditions that you placed upon love. Those are just conditions that you placed upon peace, love, and joy. Those are just conditions that you placed upon God. So the fruit of the Spirit of God is peace, love, and joy. If you're experiencing anything other than peace, love, and joy, that means you are not producing the fruit of, of God. That means you are not tapped in to the Spirit of God. That means you've disconnected yourself in your own experience. You're no longer uh, a, a branch on the vine. Now you're a branch cut off from the vine, which is withering and dying. So if you experience any sort of lack in you whatsoever or around you whatsoever, that means you are living inside of a delusional false experience of separation from God. In the Garden of Eden, the only thing that was lacking was lack. And Adam and Eve, they, left, they walked right on past everything and went for nothing. I want that because they perceived themselves to not be enough because the serpent said, hey, if you'll bite this fruit, you'll know everything God knows. Ooh, you'll be like God. Ooh, I'd really like to be like God. Now, God already created them. They were absolutely perfect in every way, yet they left, left the truth in leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be, wanting to become perfect. I want to be like God. So there's something missing in me. And so they live, move from the, the, the abundance mindset, the abundant reality into a new mindset that there's something missing and I got to get it. 
And what was missing was the knowledge of good and evil. You need to know what good is and know what bad is. Ooh, okay, I really like to know what that is. Okay, great. And then they did the one thing they weren't supposed to do, which would bite the fruit. Now they got the knowledge of what good is and what evil is, which there is no such thing as evil because God created everything. And after it was done, he said, it is good. So it's all good. Yet they have a belief that there's something missing. The only thing that's missing is evil. They're like, there's got to be something more than everything. The only thing more than everything is nothing. So they give up everything for nothing. They give up good for evil, which doesn't even exist. They give up truth for lies. And so they disconnect themselves from, from life and, pers- and sin is not the action to be punished. It's the perception to be corrected. Now they got a false perception, a false perspective of, there's, of not enoughness, of scarcity mindset, of scarce reality. And they go and begin to manifest that the moment that they take the action to reinforce the illusion of something is missing. There is nothing missing. Nothing is the only thing that is missing. But you're chasing, you're leaving, you're leaving everything in the pursuit of what appears to be something. You're calling something everything. Like, ooh, there's something out there. But there is nothing out there. There is nothing out there. Everything is in here. And then once you got everything in here, then guess what appears out there? Oh, everything. That's why God says, seek first the kingdom. Seek when the kingdom? Seek first the kingdom and all this will be added to you. Everything that you could ever want, need, desire will be added to you because the entire creation is bowing to you. Humans were created as the kings to take dominion, the kingdom. This is our kingdom that we were meant to take dominion over. Jesus is kingdom of heaven. He's the king of heaven. And then he created this earth as an extension. And he created us as kings and queens to rule over, take dominion, says be fruitful and multiply, take dominion, subdue all of creation, take dominion, and then bring heaven to earth through you. You are now my kings and queens on earth, and you're going to take orders from headquarters and then establish my kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So earth as an extension, expression of heaven. And so we... uh, instead of taking orders from head, head, headquarters, we took, started taking orders from headquarters, our head, our own head, our own disconnected delusional head. And then we start making up lies and illusions and believing things to be true that aren't even true, believing there's such a thing as lack, believing there's something missing. There, uh, there, again, there's nothing missing. The only thing that's missing is nothing. The only thing that's ever been missing is nothing. Let me say that. The only thing that's ever been missing is nothing. And so I can either have nothing or everything. So which one do you want? Nothing or everything. So then stop leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. Stop leaving everything in the pursuit of what appears to be everything. <gasps> this woman would be my everything. No, that's your nothing. That's just a package. This house will be my everything. No, that's nothing. That's just a package. This um, career will be my everything. No, that's nothing. That's just a package. Those are just things. Those are, those are packages for, for everything to flow through. But if you're saying, if you're putting the conditions upon everything, you're, you're saying, God, you can only give me everything through this. You can only give me everything through that, through him or through her. Then you've just disconnected yourself and put all these conditions. You've cut off, you've cut yourself off from the flow of everything. And now all you got is a little nothing that's going to wither and die. Whether it's a house, a spouse, a, a body or a bank account, that thing will wither and die one day. And so you've compartmentalized everything in this thing that is dying. Is everybody following right now? Man, that's crazy. Can you see how crazy that is? So, um, so the difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it, how you know when you're ready to receive it is when you realize that it's here now, it always has been and always will be. That's why when we do the resistance release, we let go of the fear like, of like, whatever it is you're afraid of happening. Like I'm a, your fear of, what's a fear that pops up for people? Anybody got any fears? Not enough money. Fear of being broke. What? Failure. Fear of failure. Fear, yeah, fear of being broke, or what, right? So whatever the fear is, and then there's desire, okay? I'm afraid of being broke. I really want to be wealthy. So you're, the fear and the desire are pushing up against each other. You're afraid of not, you're, you're, you're afraid of this thing, and you're afraid of not having the thing that you want. Like you're, you're really wanting the thing, but if you're wanting the thing, that means you're perceiving that it's not here already. And if the world truly is your mirror, if it appears without, though it is within, and you believe that you don't have the thing, just like Jesus said, those who have will be given more. Those who have not, even what they have 
will be taken from them. Why? Because it's an inside job. It's just a reflection of a projection. Whatever you perceive yourself to be, willpower will never overpower your subconscious beliefs about yourself because the world is just reflecting back who you are. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. So, if you've got, if you really want this thing, that means you perceive that you don't have it already, which means the reflection is always going to reflect back to you that you don't have it. It's always going to be at, the dis- at a distance. But even if you do get it, maybe you get the package. Okay, cool. Wow, I got the million dollars that I always wanted. Okay, cool. You got the package. Wow, I got the, the spouse that I always wanted. Now you got the package. But again, it's not, you never wanted the, you didn't want the million dollars. You didn't want the spouse. You wanted what you thought those things were going to give you. So now you got the package. And remember what I said earlier, if you get something before you're ready to receive it, what's going to happen? You're going to destroy it or it's going to destroy you. One of those two things. So some broke person who's been wanting a million dollars for so long, they win the lottery, make, win $10 million. Woo, that's 10 times more than I could ever even expect to imagine. What happens to most of those people within two years? They go broke. They go, they're worse off than before they started. They go bankrupt and they're worse off than before they started. Somebody who believes they're not enough Unless they have this spouse and they get the spouse, what happens to those relationships? It, it turns into hell. Two, the two halves don't make a whole in relationships. Two halves make a hell. It's just full on hell. It's worse. They're, damn, I wish I, I want to get back to be alone again. What they've been waiting for for 10 years. And then they finally get this relationship and now they're miserable. All that did was magnify the misery that was already inside of them. Because they weren't ready to receive it. How do you know you're not ready to receive it? When you perceive that it's not here already. So you're leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. Versus seeking first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. That's what God said. Do what God says. Go follow wisdom instead of foolishness. God's already told you the way that it works. Yet for some reason we go do everything except for the one thing. We do it every way except for God's way. And that's insane. Unless you just want to suffer. If you want to suffer then that's actually very sane. Is anybody here your goal is to suffer? Oh, well, then every time you're doing that, you're just insane. I mean, it'd be fine if you wanted to suffer. Just don't do it God's way. That's, really, that's a really great way to suffer is just don't do it God's way. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's your goal, suffering, cool, then do that. But if you would like to end the, the illusion, suffering is just an illusion in the first place. If you'd like to end that, then just stop doing it your way and start doing it God's way. So... How do you know when you're ready to receive it? When you realize it's here now, it always has been, it always will be. So again, we let go of the fear. I'm so afraid of of being broke, but the desire, I'd really like to be wealthy. So that means you're perceiving yourself to not be wealthy already, which means what's the mirror going to have to reflect to you, that you're not wealthy. And even if it does give you $10 million, you will have to destroy it. You will have to sabotage it because now it's no longer in alignment with the truth of what you, who you perceive yourself to be. His willpower will never overpower your subconscious beliefs about yourself because the world is just your mirror reflecting back to you. So you get the thing and then you destroy the thing. So that's why we do the resistance release. Let go of the fear, let go of the desire, and then we step into the truth. So I let go of the fear of being broke. I let go of the desire to being wealthy. I accept that I am wealthy and always have been. I accept that I am wealthy and always have been. I accept that I am wealthy and always have been. I accept that I am wealthy and always have been. Oh, oh, wow. And now you're in the truth. And guess what happens to your mirror? Easily and effortlessly, it just starts to recreate itself around you. It's an inside job. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That's literally how this thing works. That's all Jesus was telling us about the whole time. Whenever he would heal somebody, he didn't say, I healed you. He said, it was your faith that healed you. It was your belief that you were healed is why you got healed in the physical. The physical is following the invisible. So the unseen is more real than what you can see. The unseen is moving the scene. It says that in the Bible. The the scene is being moved by the unseen. There's a metaphysical to the physical. The physical is just a little... It says, it's after all the, all the roots have been, happened, everything's gone on where you can't see it, and then a sprout shows out. And then, ooh, look at that, we've got to see. But all the things that had to happen to make that sprout come out, you couldn't even see that stuff. It was, there was all this life that was going on beneath the surface before you got a sprout. So the unseen is moving the scene. 
So we're here to walk by faith, not by sight. Because if you're walking by sight, all you're going to do is see what's not there. You're, gonna, you're, you're not going to see what's being moved. You're not going to actually see where the movement is. You're going to see what's already happened. But what's already happened is already dead. They're like the Bible says, the dead letter killeth. Like the Bible says, if you're just talking, if you're just regurgitating what God said, then you're, you're dead. You're dead. If you're just regurgitating what God said, then you are, you are dead. The dead letter killer. It's even, he's even talk, he's talking about the Bible. He's talking about the Bible. If you're just regurgitating what the Bible said, then you're dead. It's not about what God said. It's about what God is saying. So you got to hear, we, this is a living God. He's alive right now. It's, it's not dead, it's not dead words. It's, it's, a, it's about where the words are coming from and then where you're going when you follow them. And so, but it's about a movement. It's about staying, in, staying alive, staying in a movement. And so, we're here to walk by faith, not by sight, because you can't even see what's moving everything. You can't see it with your eyes. You're not here to walk by your eyes, because your eyes are just reflecting back what's already been done. But what's already been done is none of your business. What's your, what's your business? It's what God is doing, What's been done is not your business. What's going to be done is not, it's what God is doing. And so you're just staying and, and allowing yourself to experience what God is doing right here and right now. And what God is doing right here and right now, he's doing something for your future, but your future is already his past because he's an eternity. Like uh, what you perceive to be future is like, is his, his past, his present, his future because he's in eternity before Abraham was, I am, before Abraham was, I am. Wait, hold on. Where's that at? That doesn't even line up. Before, before Abraham was, before Abraham was, so I'm here. Abraham was here. And before Abraham was, I am. Wait, where are you at? I can't even put you on my timeline anywhere, brother. Because he's not on a timeline. He's above the timeline. He transcends the timeline. And that's where he's bringing you to as well, to transcend the timeline. So the past is rooted in the future. Everybody say that. The past is rooted in the future. What does that mean? The past is rooted in the future. The past, so the roots of the past, the, so the past is rooted in the future. So the roots of the past, the roots of what have already happened is in what's going to happen? Well, no, how's that possible? No, like the, the, the roots come first. Yes, the future came before the past did in eternity. You just don't, God had it all planned out. Everything that you're going through, God already knew. God already knows. He knew what you were going to go through and he knows what you're going to, he knew what you went through and what you're going to go through. It's all part of the plan. Everybody say it's all part of the plan. We, we talked about that last week. We said, uh, you know, we are meaning making masters. Every moment is inherently meaningless. We assign the meaning to the moment. Whatever meaning we assign is going to determine the experience that we have. And so if you assign any meaning to any moment other than God's on the throne, if you make this moment mean anything other than God's on the throne, that means you've kicked yourself out of, out of God's kingdom in your own experience. Now, you're still chilling in God's kingdom. God's still on the throne. Just because you don't perceive God to be on the throne does not make God not on the throne. God is still on the throne whether you perceive it or not. You just don't get to experience all the fruits of being a child of God in his kingdom if you kick yourself out with your own beliefs, with your own lies. Does that make sense? So, you, you can make any meaning you want to any moment. Are you, do you, are you aware that you can make any meaning that you want to any moment? You can take any moment and literally just, woo, whatever you want to make it. You can, you got infinite imagination. The ego is, is infinitely imaginative. That thing will just go crazy. It'll, it'll keep going from every, every, every wave from Sunday. I mean, it'll, it'll find a way. I mean, I watch, dude, uh, there's a guy that was here not too long ago. He is the dead letter killeth. He was all about the dead letter. That's all. It was like he just, it was about just regurgitation of words, but there was no connection to the life inside of him. And man, it's like so the, the depth of delusion that the guy lives inside of. Like he's got all these crazy stories and he's just blah, 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 all over the place and he just keeps going because that ego is infinitely imaginative. It's the craziest thing, but your ego's done the same thing. Making up all these meanings to moments that don't even exist, just making up whatever you want to make up about it. I mean, just, I, I harp on this quite a bit because, it, because of how insane it is, how dysfunctional and delusional it is. The Christmas it's supposed to be Moss Christ. Moss means more. So it's supposed to be more Christ. But it's anti-Christ. 
The whole thing is less Christ. Let's give up presents for presents, packages. Like the exact opposite of what we're talking about here. The atonement is the exact opposite. Let's compartmentalize love. Let's put it in these boxes. And this how I, that's what means that, that I love you and someone loves you. And you're like, oh, oh, but how come my brother got a better gift than me? Oh, okay, that means I don't have any love and he's got all the love. And, but, but mom, if you'll go make a whole bunch more money or get further into debt so that you can buy me this thing, then we'll, we'll all have love. And all that's happening is now the people are getting further and further in debt in this complete consumerism conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact that people are lost inside of consumerism. And Christmas is made to perpetuate that whole problem. And so, but, the, but the, that's not even the, the insane part. The insane part is, is that families get together to create a full-on conspiracy for their children to make up this lie about some Santa Claus that does not exist, that's never existed, and say that's where your gifts are coming from. What the hell? And literally all get together and lie to the children right out this like this one like right out the gates. All the family members come together and lie to their children and think that's okay. How is that okay? That's insane, y'all. So, uh, the point is, like, we can make up whatever meanings to whatever, like, they, we can just make up whatever. There's, there's, like, literally all of civilization is, they made up some story about some dude that goes down a chimney in the middle of the night and then comes to eat your uh, cookies and then drinks the milk and like, there's like hundreds of millions or billions of people that are playing this dumb game that's just made up. And the whole like world's in on it. Versus a historical fact, Jesus came to earth, walked around the earth, he died, and then he, he was murdered on a cross, and then, he was resur- and then he resurrected. That's a historical fact, but let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about this fat dude that somehow miraculously squeezes through the chimney and gives you and eats your cookies at night. And he, get, he goes to everybody all over the planet in one night. Wow, that's a miracle. No, that's a lie. Jesus walked on the earth. He was uh, crucified and then he resurrected. That's a miracle. And it's the truth. It literally happened in reality. But Christmas, more Christ, is about a lie versus the truth. That's crazy. So we can make up whatever we want, live in whatever delusion we want to live in. That's fine. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, if you've ever done mushrooms or acid or something, you can see how much, how not real you can make something be more real than real. I was like, wow, this is really real. No, that's actually not real. <laughs> You see somebody with their VR goggles on. Wow, look how real this is. No, that's not real. You're making things not real seem really real, more real than real. It's not real. So you can make any meaning to any moment, but if you uh, assign any meaning to any moment other than God's on the throne, then you're disconnecting yourself from the kingdom, from the truth. And you're connecting yourself from something that just... You're, you're head, you're, now you've got lies in your eyes, fears in your ears, judgments in your heart, and you're, heading on, you're getting further and further disconnected from the truth. So, um, the unseen is more seen than, or more real than what you can see. Walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, because, you, again, you can't see what God is doing. So, if you're looking at, if you're trying to walk by your sight, you have no clue. Like, you might think that you know what God is doing, you have no idea. Like, even if you think, see, God's, God's plans are eternal, but let's just say it was only multi-generational. Let's just say it's only, let, let's, let's take it from eternity, even though it is eternal, let's just put it in a, in a, in a, 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 a package that you can relate to. Shrink it down and realize, oh, God's not just planning for tomorrow. He's not just planning for you for tomorrow. He's not just planning for you for next week. Even at a very grossly 
shrunk down version of what God's doing. Really, really small because he's planning, it's eternity, but let's say he's just planning for all of humanity for the next five generations. Okay? So let's just say he's got all of humanity for the next three generations. We'll just, or let's half, let's say half of humanity. Let's say, well, let's say a quarter of humanity for the next four generations. Let's say that's all God's got planned, which we know he's got all of eternity, everyone for all of eternity in plan, in mind. But let's just shrink it down really, really small. So all of, or let's say one quarter of humanity for four generations. That's grossly shrunken down so that we can relate to it. But how much, is, how much bigger is that than how you plan? A quarter of humanity for four generations. Most people are thinking about what they're going to be doing for dinner tonight and worried about that. Are we going to get dinner for tonight? Ah! Like, that's... You're, so when you think that you know what God's doing, you can't see that big. You don't know why he just did what he just did. You might know why he just did what he did and relate. You can come up with a meaning for why he just did what you did that can relate to your reality for the next month or something. But it's not just about your next month. It's about everyone's eternity. Everything God does is about everyone's eternity. Everyone say, everything God does is about everyone's eternity. It's not just something God does. It's about some person's few moments. It's everything God does. It's about everyone's eternity. It's so freaking massive. There's no way that you could ever figure out why he did what he did and why he's doing what he's doing and why he's going to do what he's going to do. It's impossible. So get out of that game. It's just a game that's keeping you disconnected from the giver of the gift. What's the gift this moment? Who gave it, God? So be present to the present of the present. He gave you this moment right here, right now. This one moment in time is yours. But he never promised you another one. If you got this one, take that gift. He didn't promise you more than this one. He promised you eternity if you'll receive him. But if you don't do that, then what's promised is nothing. There is no promises. Without him, there is no promise. He is the promise. So, um, walk by faith, not by sight. So, what does that mean, walk by faith, not by sight? It, it's you, if you let it live in you until you live in it. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. The substance of things not yet seen. You can't see it. So if you're walking by sight, you can't see. Faith is the currency of heaven, but you can't see it's heaven. You can't even, you, you can't tap into the currency of heaven. You have no relationship to heaven. You have no experience. No, you can't even get a, a, pinky, a pinky finger into, into heaven without faith. And so if you're looking through your eyes, listening with your ears, you're missing reality, heaven. And you're looking at what you're calling reality, which is time, which actually isn't it. And so, uh, the, I, so faith is one of my gifts that God has given me, bestowed upon me. I'm very gifted. I'm, a, I'm extraordinarily gifted in faith. And um, it's actually, I actually had that gift even before I had God in my own awareness. When I was an evangelist atheist, I had the gift of faith. And so, God, I talk, we talked about this last week, I think, or maybe the week before, about God gives you these gifts, but God gave you the gift. That's why it's called a gift. It's not like your gift of singing. Like, you didn't create your gift. God gave you the gift, but it's your job to nurture it, nourish it, to grow it, to grow that gift, but you can't create the gift. A lot of people are trying to create gifts for themselves that aren't gifts. They're something that they made up. They're, they're Ishmael's. They're false creations that are never going to give them. The reason people are struggling and suffering is because they're trying to do something they were never meant to do, making up their own gifts. So if it's a gift, God gave it to you. Your job is then to nurture it, nourish it, develop it, but you can't create it. 
perfect example. Again, I've had the gift of faith. God gave me that gift even before I believed in God. God already believed in me. And so I was talking with uh, Phoenix the other day. We started at the table. I was sharing, you know, about the way I I relate to reality from eternity, uh, from the truth, instead of from these temporal illusory, uh, illusory circumstances that are coming and going and passing. And I could, I could see how she's relating in time and, oh, no, it's not done. Oh, no, it's not going to work. And she's freaking out all the time because she can't control what's happening and she's, like, measuring it. And it's not working or whatever because she's looking from a teeny tiny little limited perspective. And so then I was talking to the other day uh, to really help her get the revelation of, of faith and eternity. And so I knew, I, see, I used to do real estate investing. When I was an evangelist atheist, I was a real estate investor, and I was really good at it. And I, I knew that she had, was a real estate investor, were doing fix and flips. And so I related this to her. So some of you, uh, I, whether you've had this experience or not, find some way to f- experience what I'm sharing with you. So I knew that she had had this experience because I knew that she was a fix and flipper real estate investor, and I know what it's like being that identity. And so I shared with her about eternity and faith. I said, remember when you were doing real estate investing and you walked into some beat down old nasty house where uh, the only reason it's still standing is because the cockroaches are holding hands or the termites are holding hands, holding it together. <laughs> That's the only thing holding that house. Like, you walked into a house that's nasty, like just gnar-gnar, right? She said, yeah, I've definitely walked in. And, and you lit up when you saw those houses, didn't you? She's like, yeah, those, that's the gold right there. Like, ah. Why did you light up? Because you already saw what it could be. And it wasn't like, I wonder if this, it wasn't a logical thing. It was a vision as soon as you walked in, you already knew what it could be. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And you were standing inside of that house as it, as it was going to be before it was. Anybody relate? You know, you know what I'm saying? So that's what faith is. That's literally, you're standing inside of the, it's the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. You don't see it yet, but there's already substance. There's already evidence inside of you. It's already done. Let it live in you until you live in it. That's faith. That's where, so that's where Jesus is coming from, and he came into time from there, and that's what he delivered to me from eternity, special delivery from eternity into time, and so the eternity is living inside of me. But that gift of faith, again, God gave that to me, and so now I've been nurturing and nourishing it for his glory instead of just to go a business that was just to feed my flesh just so I could survive and build my ego and feel really successful. Ooh, look what I did. Yay, now am I happy? Nope, still not happy yet. Oh, hey, look what I did. I've given my family everything they want. Are they happy? Nope, they're still not happy. Huh, well, this isn't working, so there's got to be something else. So that's when I finally went to God because everything that I did, I did everything, and everything that I did, did nothing. And I finally had to come face to face with that fact that, oh, it's got to be something else because all this is nothing. All of what every, everyone said everything is, is nothing because I did it. I got all the success. I did everything that everyone said would make you, make you feel like a winner. And I did it all. And I didn't just feel like a winner. I felt like an ultimate loser because there's nothing else to do. After uh, the, um, whether, whether it actually happened or not, but uh, we'll just use the, metaf- use the metaphor for what it's intended for. When the people went to the moon, and then they came back, yeah, so we're like, did they actually go to the moon? I don't know, but, uh, but uh, let's just say they did. <laughs> but uh, after they went to the moon and they came back, they were all miserable and depressed. Why? Because now they had no longer had anything to look forward to. They did it, the pinnacle. They did the, what they've been preparing for their whole life, and they went to the moon, and then it's over. And now what am I going to do with it? What am I going to get inspired about now for the rest of my life like that? Nobody's ever been to the moon before. It was impossible. I just did the impossible. There's not another impossible for me to, and and, and enough time for me to head towards anymore. So they, there was, there there was nothing more inspiring. There was no more vision. There was nothing inspiring in them anymore. Uh, And so, because it was still all about 
what's happening in the world, what's happening in time, about their identity, who they, who they are in time, their, their egoic identity. And, uh, but once you build that thing and get what it wants, I mean, one of Satan's greatest tools is keeping you from getting what your ego wants, keeping it hope deferred, just keeping it just out of reach, because so you'll never find out that that whole thing is just bullshit. Because if you got it, just like all the other successful people, everyone who gets it realizes, oh, there's nothing there. So he'll just keep it dangling. Oh, no, no, just keep a little further. Just keep it, no, just a little bit further. Just a little bit, keep going. No, 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 you can keep going, keep going. You're going to get it. And then when you get it uh, for a minute there, you're like, oh, no, you got some, some goal. Ooh, I did it. And then it goes away. But just, just in time, Satan will come in and say, but wait a minute. You know, you can do better. You can do bigger. You can do better. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Woo. And he hooks, hooks you again into the future one more time for something that's going to happen. And so when you talk about faith, it's not about something that's going to happen. It's about something that happened. So when I entered into that house, it was already done. I, within, within three minutes, every time I'd walk into a house, I already knew if I was going to buy it or not. I already knew what I was going to pay for it. I already knew how much it was going to cost me to re, 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 rehab it. I already knew what it was going to look like when it was done, and I already knew what it was going to sell for. Within three minutes, it was already done. I walked in, and, and it just downloads into me. I'm like, boop, and it's completely done inside of me. And then I walk out, and then, and then over time, in time it takes time, so over time it became done, but everything that, it was already done in me before it was done. So that's, there was no like yearning, like, ah, it was, it was already done. It's like, you know, a lot of times like, you go order something off of Amazon and then it's there a few days later. But you don't just keep clicking it. You don't just keep ordering over and over. <laughs> Did they send it yet? It, and let me order another one in case they didn't send it. Or let me order another one in case they didn't send it. Let me order another one in case they didn't send it. Let me order another one in case they didn't send it. Let me order another one. You don't order 50,000 of the same thing over and over in case they didn't send the first one. But that's what people are doing with God all the time. That's lack of faith. So you see the, the different worlds? So, difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. How do you know you're ready to receive it? When you realize it's here now. Always has been and always will be. So, you've already got the feeling of the wish fulfilled. It's already inside you. And then, it'll show itself to you on the outside. Like, I already know there's so many. Like, when we bought this village, I, I already knew I was going to be standing inside of this village nine years ago. I already knew you were going to be here nine years ago. In this moment, I already knew you would be here. Uh... Brandy's trying to get in right now. I already knew Brandy was going to be trying to get in right now. Nine years ago. I already knew, like, it was already, this moment was already done so long ago. And that's why, like, all the crazy shit that I walked through, it didn't even, that didn't matter to me. All the hell that I walked through along this journey, none of that mattered to me. It wasn't mattering to me. This was mattering to me. And where we're going is mattering to me. More than what's already mattered is what's mattering through me from God. Because God's already said what was going to happen here. He's already said he was using me to birth a new monetary system, to, to birth a new earth. He already, he already said that. I'm not doing it because I said that. I'm doing it because I'm not doing it at all. I'm being done. And because I'm being done, the things that, are, that have already mattered in the world, are, they don't matter to me whatsoever at all. They, I've got zero value in anything that's already matter. All the dead, the dead stuff out there. It's all, what's alive in me is God in me. And then God is using me to extend and express himself into this world. And that's what he's lighting up inside of you as you're receiving what's coming through me. Him coming through me is lighting up him in you. And you're starting, the, the him in you is starting to matter in you more than this world. And it's that God in you is going to start mattering and mattering to you, for you, through you, more than anything in this world that's, that's ever mattered before. Because it's not about what God said, it's about what God is saying. And what he's saying is you. You are what he's saying. He's saying you into existence right now. He's saying you to, into existence right forever now. So, um, so walking by faith, not by sight, you immediately see what, what it will be and live in that vision way before it's complete in the physical don't let your eyes or ears deceive you away from what has already been done in the truth. If, if it's a promise from God, it's done. And that's the, it's, not, it's, not, it's not going to be done. In God's world, it's already done. Before Abraham was, I am. So the past is rooted in the future. 
So I'm, what's, what's humanity's perceptual future is my past. Because I'm already on the other side of time for, for humanity. I'm already, because, I'm already, you know, in, in, in the illusion of time, humanity is going on a journey from the head to the heart, from the mind through the emotions to the heart, from slavery to freedom, from Egypt to the promised land. I'm already chilling in the promised land, and I know the journey ahead for humanity because it's the journey behind for me. I've already walked it. So I already know what it's going to take for them to go from the head to the heart, from, from the kingdom of Babylon, of Satan, into the kingdom of God. I already know that journey. And so the past is rooted in the future, uh, when, uh, so the metaphor that I use for that is when you're watching a movie and you swear you know who the killer is and then you get to the final scene and then suddenly turns out you were wrong the entire movie. You, the, the bad guy was the good guy. The good guy was the bad guy the whole time. It's not that it changed in the final scene. The whole time. This was the bad guy. When you were rooting for him, that was the bad guy. When you were wanting the good guy to go to jail, the, the bad, you were a bad guy. That whole time, that was the good guy. The one you were rooting for was the bad guy, and the one you were saying, take him down, was the good guy. The whole time, you just weren't privy to that because you were still, you weren't living, you were living in time from what you could see. You weren't living from eternity from what you know to be the truth. So that final scene changes the entire past when you're living in time. In eternity, there is no time. So it's not changing anything in eternity. It's just changing linearly in time. Oh, crap, all that time. I really thought that was, wow, you were wrong the entire time. You made meanings to a moment because you were just playing in little tiny, little small. You couldn't see the whole picture. You couldn't even see a teeny little speck of the picture. And you were calling that the whole, imagine if you go to a party and the lights are off and then you, and you get a flashlight and you look over in the corner and you see two people fighting and, and that's all you ever got to see from the party. And then somebody says, what was that party like? Uh, just people fighting. But if you were to turn on the whole light, that was the only couple in the whole place that was fighting. That's not what the party was about. That's just what you saw. Because you saw a teeny tiny little piecey, piecey piece fragment of the, of the thing, of what it actually is. You can't see. So stop walking by your stupid sight. Because it's, all it's showing you is illusions and lies. Get out of your head and into your heart. Walk by faith, not by sight. Seek first the kingdom. Seek when the kingdom? Seek first the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? It's within. And everybody say, I'm going to go within. Because if I don't go within, I'm going to go without. And if I go without, I'm going to get lost out there. So, um, so don't, yeah, so I was saying, like, this was already done. These villages, all the, 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 the new earth has already been birthed. And I'm already sitting inside of it. I've been si- sitting inside of it for now in clock time, nine years. Since January 25th, 2015, I've been sitting inside of the new earth. Even though humanity was not, I am. And so all the crazy shit that like was, how did you keep going? I didn't keep going. I was already am. Already, and it was, I'm just, you know, watching it all play out. There was like, there was no way for me to turn around and walk a different direction. Because I'm already here. I've already decided on truth and truth matters to me more than time. So time will not deceive me. My eyes will not deceive me. My ears will not deceive me. No one and no thing can deceive me because I am with I am. So uh, in, that, in your journey, so don't let your eyes, eyes and ears deceive you away from what has already been done in truth. So just don't dig up in fear what you planted in faith. In time, it takes time. So it's, but it's already fruited inside of you. Like you, got, you feel it like, oh, it's done. It's done. And so that it's doneness is the faith. But if you let your eyes or ear deceive you and you're looking down, they're like, ah, you know, the, the, I planted that, but there's no sprout, man. I planted that seed and there's no sprout. Nothing's happening. No, I don't know. And then somebody comes and says, hey, yeah, you, uh, you messed up, man. 
No, uh, I, I don't even think you even put a seed there. <laughs> You've been watering that thing for six months now. Nothing's happening. So people come starting to tell you, tell you, oh no, you did something wrong. You did something wrong. And if you believe the doubters, if you believe the fears in your ears, and you go dig up that seed to go find out if you did it right or not, what happens? You kill it. It was just about to sprout. And you kill it because of your doubt. Don't dig up in fear what you planted in faith. Don't, don't, don't doubt the sprout. That's another sermon. Don't doubt the sprout. So, it's happening. You knew when you sowed the seed, you knew it was true. Don't let your eyes and ears deceive you. Because they will. Because it's just a reflection of a projection of, of a past you that was smaller. It was smaller than who you are now. And always have been, but you just didn't know because you had not tapped into the future that was actually writing your past. Once you've hit it, that's when we talk about if you don't want your pain to be in vain, turn your mess into a message. You thought it was a mess, but it, all, a mess, uh, uh, all a message is is an aged mess. Mess, age. It's an aged mess. You thought it was a mess, but in the future, in your future, which is now your present, that mess was a message. You get to go back and say, hey, I got a message for, all, for the me in the past. I've been where you are. You're about to go through some dark stuff. I see. I know exactly what you're thinking. I know exactly where. I know what you're about to go through, or what you're, what you're going through, what you've been through, and what you're you know, about, about to go through. I can see it all because I was once in that mess, but now I've come to you from your future to tell you I've got a message is that you don't have to suffer. You can actually pop right out right now. You just need to cleanse your lens. You got to get the fears out of your ears, the lies out of your eyes, or the judgment out of your heart, and then you're going to be free to receive the kingdom that's actually present right now. The difference between wanting something, where you're wanting to go, the difference between wanting, wanting that and being ready to receive it. But I can, I'm here from where you want to go to actually make you ready to receive it by showing you that it's in you right now. Where you, you're trying to get out of this mess so that you can get to some place, some far off place, but wherever you go, there you are. You're just going to get yourself in the same spot again. It's going to be a different circumstance, a different physical manifestation, but it's going to be the same thing inside of you. And so I'm here as a message from the future an, of your aged mess to come back and share with you it's not a mess, it's a message. And you can be set free right here, right now. You don't have to suffer. Suffering is just resisting what is. And your worrying is praying for exactly what you don't want. You're worried about something. The reason you're worrying about something is because we go where we live emotionally. We use our environment to get ourselves there. The environment is not the problem. It's your addiction to suffering is the problem. And we can heal that right now from the inside out. Shift your way of being. Then it'll shift your way of doing. And then it'll shift your way of having from the inside out. So... I didn't even know all that message was in there that was about to come through so flowy like that. Yeah, I want that. So, so when would now be a good time for heaven? Now, uh, Ecclesiastes 9, this is um, King Solomon, which is who our son's soul is named after. Wisest man who ever, ever existed. Now, in time, Solomon existed for, before, before the answer had showed up. In time. So, he... Uh, when you he hear what he reads right here, or what he, what he wrote right here, realize in time, he, uh, he was not privy to what was coming, which was Jesus. And so all he could see was what he saw. But with what he saw, this was all a perfect, important part and what he said is important for you to hear right here, right now. God had a plan from the whole thing. The entire Bible is all God's plan. It's so wild when you watch how complete, when you go through that whole journey, how complete the whole thing is from the beginning to the end. Like everything is so perfectly functional, working with each other to ex for as an ex expression of truth coming into time. Through our, all of our journey, everything that we have, we, that we go through as, as human beings coming home or, coming home from, the, from, slavery to, from, from slavery to freedom, from Egypt to the promised land. That whole Bible, like it's all in there so perfectly. There's another part, you know, in like, uh, are we going to, hopefully we'll get to A Course in Miracles. I got A Course in Miracles, which is a, you know, another revelation that where, because I watch all the, uh, the Bible thumpers that are all in there about the words 
You know, it's even so, it, the Bible starts in, as the law, the Jewish religion and traditions, and it's just the following the law. And obviously that's not going to work. You're never going to, you're never going to be able to follow the law perfectly forever, so that means none of you are saved. You're all, you all fail. You're all broken. But that's cool because God had a plan. Jesus. And then phew, Jesus shows up, enters into time, and, and brings us away home. And then, of course, in miracles is Jesus speaking as well. Uh, and now it's the revelation to receive the atonement, the atonement. Because like if you're even like even if you're just stuck in the in the uh, like in the New Testament, most of the people like again I you know I I I've, I can I can't, don't believe that I've ever seen uh, a Bible thumper that actually has an experience of peace, love, and joy, and freedom, like a true experience. I've seen them regurgitated. I've seen them talk about it, but I've never actually seen them experience it. It live in them, and them live in it. I've never seen it happen. And uh, that, that doesn't mean that it won't, but I've just never seen it uh, because they're missing a, a, the revelation. It's like, it's like when people go to AA. They never their identity never actually shifts. They never actually receive because now even after they go through, maybe they don't, they're not, they, they, they break their, uh, they overcome their uh, succumbing to addiction. And so now they are no longer uh, being ran by their addictions, but they're still addicts. And they're supposed to just believe that about themselves for the rest of their lives. They never actually get out. So they, they did what they needed to do in order to get them to their next chapter. But then there's still another chapter. Hey, now it's time to just purify the, the old identity. It's let, let that thing go so you can move on into the kingdom. And so uh, that's what, when I'm going to be reading about the atonement from Course in Miracles and a little bit. So it's the actual revelation here in time, eternity here in time for you to receive it. So if you've, if you've done, if you, if you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Okay, cool. Now you've got your salvation, and then freedom, and then you, uh, freedom is a process. After you've been processed, you're actually going to get to experience heaven on earth. That's what Jesus, what the whole thing was for in the first place, on earth as it is in heaven. You actually get to experience peace and love and joy, unconditional peace, love, and joy. You actually get to experience the promise that Jesus came to provide. But you've got you, you've to make it, you, you've got to receive him after he's dead in time. And so... There's a receiving of it, and uh, who here would like to receive the atonement now? Who, who, who wants it? Instead of just having it postponed in the future for another time, ready to receive it now. All right, so let me uh, read through here. We're, I got a couple Bible verses, and then I'm going to get to that. So Ecclesiastes 9, again, this is King Solomon back in time before there was to Jesus. It says, so I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who not, do not. As it is with the good, so it is with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. There is, this is evil in everything that happens under the sun. Some destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterward, they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. And even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, with whom you love. All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, 
There is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. I've seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them, upon them. You don't know when your last moment is. But what you do know for sure is one day will be your last day. When would now be a good time to appreciate this day as if it's that day? Uh, Mel and I, we went to... um, we were leaving after we were here in Costa Rica the first time for the four months, and then we were heading back up to the U.S. to cl- tie up some loose ends and get, get our community to come and bring them back to build these villages. We stopped up in San Jose, and it, up in a high altitude. It was really cold up there, and there's this uh, fireplace, and they had a box of matches, and we were trying to light the fire. And, <laughs> And like we doing doing everything, like we're trying everything. We had all the we had toilet paper. We had uh, getting out some little kindling out from outside. I mean the logs were there, and and we're doing everything. And we had cardboard, and we just couldn't get anything to go. And like some of the matches just and they went out and out. And I'm like, and uh, and just what? And we had a whole box of matches. It was probably I don't know, maybe maybe somewhere between fifty and hundred probably. And, we're, and none of them worked. And then we got to the last match. We're like, oh, shit. Like, this is our last one. Like, we really want this fire. And this is our last match. So this has to work. And we both looked at each other, and we felt, we're like, this is our last match. And we're like, this one's going to work. This one's and we knew it. We knew this one was going to work. Even though the last hundred did not work, everything that we did all that time, it didn't work. And there was nothing different about this one. This one had the same chance as the rest of them. The only difference between this one and those is this was our last match. And we knew it. And we acted accordingly. See, decision is all in, it's cut off from all of their options, it's all in. I, you know, use the metaphor of, you know, 99% decision is not enough. If you're in a monogamous relationship and your partner is 99% monogamous, that's not enough. It's an all-in thing. It's done already. You're not thinking about, oh, I hope there. So, hope leads to faith, but you got to imagine hope being third base and faith being home. Faith is the currency of heaven. Once you get to faith, you've already made it home. If you're not home, you're not in faith. Difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. You want home, you want heaven. Difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. How you know you're ready to receive it is when you realize it's here now, it always has been, always will be. Well, that's faith. So how you get get into the door is with faith, believing that it's here now. Your faith heals you. So it's the absolute certainty and knowing this from that it's already done. But in order to get from third base to home, you got to take your foot off of third base you got to take your foot off of hope. You have to go leave hope, which you're going to experience hopeless for at least momentarily. Leave hope to get to faith. You've got to step off. So hope is the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, okay, there's still light. There's still a light there. But faith, it's like that light has to go out for a moment because you have to go to the next level. You can't solve a problem at the level of consciousness that created it. The level of consciousness of hope is perpetuating not, now not being the time. And so you're going to have to close your eyes. Stop looking at that light. Close your eyes and be present because hope is the light at the end of the tunnel. Faith is when you realize there is no tunnel. The, the light, you are the light. It's here now. It's not there. It's here. And a full-on supernova explosion. And the tunnel gets blasted open. And now you're just sitting in light. Light's in you and light's around you. So, so that's the faith. So um, 
it was done. We didn't, we didn't have hope in this match. We had faith. We knew this is it. That was our last match. Oh, we were watching um, a few weeks ago the movie uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Anybody seen Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise? And so in this movie, he uh, winds up getting, so he goes into this mission and he's supposed to, you know, take out some aliens or whatever. And then he winds up blowing up this one alien and this alien's blood gets on him and then he gets killed and then he wakes up the next day and he realizes, wait, this is the same day. He's going through the same day he just went through a moment ago. And then he winds up going through it again and he gets a little bit further this time because he already knew what was going to happen last time because it was the same day. So he gets a little further this time and then he gets killed again. I'm like, ah. And he wakes back up and he started, he's like, oh, wait, I'm waking back up. And it's like, I'm going through this thing and there's this mission that I'm on and I have to get all the way to the end. And, but he start, he's realized I got infinite lives. And so he just keeps doing it over and over and over and over. And he just gets further every time. He's like, oh, okay, this worked, that worked, worked. Oh, no, nope, start over, uh, start over, uh, start over. And he keeps getting to start, but he gets further and further. You know, sometimes he doesn't do as good that time and he has to start over sooner. He can tell when he's about, to, it's like when you're playing a video game, right? If you ever playing a video game and you've gotten like, like 90% of the way to almost beat that level, and then you, uh, you know what it takes. Like you're, you're, you got all the way to the boss man, but then the boss man whips your ass, and you got to go all the way back. Well, then if you're going and you're about 50% finished, and then you messed up, and you know you messed up because you know there's this thing that you need in order to finish the boss man, you'll go ahead and kill yourself, but you'll just right there. You're like, shh. You'll just go ahead and restart it right there because there's no point in me proceeding any further because I missed this moment. And so you know missing that moment is going to make you miss the the future moment, so you just go ahead and start over. You know what I'm saying? Anybody played that in the video game? Right? So you you, Because you you get better each time and you know what it takes. So if you've gotten this far, you know what it takes to get this far. And you know it took something here, 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 and here to get to here. And if you missed one of these things here, you might be able to get to here. You could, you could get all the way. Maybe you get to here and you miss something right here and you know it'll, t- it'll get you to here, but you know it won't get you to there. So you're like, well, there's no point in going any further because this is as far as I'll go. I might, I might be here, but I missed the thing right here. So this is as far as I can go with what I got, which means I, better, I might as well just start over. So he kept starting over and, and you know, getting further and starting over and getting better and better. And then... There is a point where cause he, they, he found out that it was the blood in him, the transfusion that he'd gotten was what made him have the lives over and over. And they said, whatever you do, make sure you kill yourself because, uh, like, if, so you'll start over. Like, if you, don't let yourself get captured because you got to start over. If, and if you get captured, they can take your blood out and then you don't get to start over again and, and then you actually die. And there was a moment where he actually you know, got knocked out and he didn't get to kill himself. So he, wa- he wakes up and they had just done a blood transfusion and took out, taken out his blood. They saved his life, but now he's, he doesn't have the blood anymore that gives him another life. So they saved his life, but it's his last life. And now there's no, so there's the story of, you know, burn the boats where this, his general takes all of his people to this island and they're, they're like, we got to take this island. And as soon as they pull up, he turns around and tells his people, burn the boats. And they're like, dude, if we burn the boats, we're not going to be able to escape. If they start to overtake us, we can't escape. He says, exactly. Because if there's, any, if there's a 1% backup plan that you might need to use this to escape, that 1% is what you actually need to make it. So burn the boat so you either die or it's it. And so there's a, there's a power in burning the boats. There's a power in this being your last life because they went way further because they knew like, it, and it was his, he had his girlfriend that he, if she died along, because she kept, she would always die first. But this time he knew if she died, then there's no way to get her back. So it was like, it was not just about him, about her too. Like no, and so he just had to go all the way and there's, there was no option this time. I have to go all the way or I die. And so I'm dead either way. So let me just kill the fear of being dead and let me have the absolute faith and certainty that this is done. And if you let doubt creep in, 
that doubt is going to cause fear. And that fear is going to block you from the flow of faith. It's all about faith. So it's all about decision. Decide. Cut off from all other option. So what if this was your last day? What if this was your last day for the atonement? What if, if you don't get freedom today, you don't get freedom? How would that be? Well, as uh, the Bible just said through King Solomon, you don't know when your last day is. Nobody knows. You don't know. You literally could just die right now of a heart attack. Like, literally. There could be a... Up there in the United States, literally now, the crazy prepared for, you know, it's, we're getting... According to Bashar, who's supposedly channeling a dude who comes from the future. <laughs> it's a future version of his alien self that he's channeling, says, okay, well, the, the, now it's the, ter- because of, he said, if, if Trump wins, then it's the termination, of, it's World War III and the termination of the United States. So, y'all sitting up there in the U.S., there could literally be a poof, bomb drop today. Like, in three seconds, three, two, poof, y'all are gone. Like, could, that would be crazy if all their screens just disappeared. <laughs> but like that, literally, something like that, literally some crazy shit like that could happen at any moment. But what's cool is, when you receive the atonement, what's cool is, so what? So what if you lose this life? Once you've received Jesus, the atonement, the atonement, the atonement, it's, so what? So what about time? I got eternity. So, uh, so if today was your last day, when would, now, when would now be a good time for heaven? Who's ready for some atonement? Who's ready for some heaven? So we don't do what we should do. We do what we must do. How are you going to make it a must for you? You got to find what it's going to take for you to decide. Which remember, you can't spell decide without die. What do you got to do so that your time-based identity can finally just lay down and die? What's, like, what's the must for you? You got to find your own must. Because you're not going to do what you should do. You got to do what, you're, what is going to make it matter to you enough to finally submit, not talk about submitting, not do submitting, be submitted. Bow to the king. Receive him. Not my will, but thy be done. What is your must? You got to find something that matters to you enough that you will make that complete death of who you're not, the death of your preferences, the death of your will. Lay it all down. What matters to you enough? Find whatever that is and make that decision. Few have the courage and few have the strength to do what it takes to fully submit to God. It takes courage and strength to submit to God. Most people, it looks like weakness to them. Because they're living in an insane, upside down, backwards world. Never will I submit. That's because you're terrified. That's what you're chicken shit. The courage and the strength that it takes to submit. And I'm not telling you theoretically. I'm a submitted man. And I know that I know what it took for it to become a must for me. I know the hell that I had to walk through. Before it mattered, and the submission and the courage that it takes to lay it all down, to give up my life completely, to give up my preferences completely, to give it all up, it, like, it ain't easy. I get it. So do you have that courage? Do you have that strength? You're only one decision away. But you've got to find something that matters enough. So why does it take so much courage and so much strength to fully submit to God? Well, it's because the, the only thing you're in control of is your smallness. And you want control. When God gets a hold of you, he's going to use you for something way bigger than you got control over. And you're going to find yourself face to face with, with Goliaths that are per- perceptually way bigger than you. As long as you're in control, you get to decide how big you get. And how big the battles you fight will be. But when you submit to God, he's going to walk you right into some fires that, you, that, that are going to burn your flesh. But he's going to be in there with you. And he's never going to put you through something that he can't pull you through. We, uh, there's the, the Marianne Williamson quote. 
Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Everyone say, this is the at one mint. We say, when would now be a good time? And we say, now is the time. And we say, this is my moment. And we say, this is the atonement. Uh, indecisive people cannot be trusted. As James 1.8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in what ways? All his ways. How you do anything is how you do everything. So if you're indecisive anywhere, you're indecisive everywhere. You're just looking like you're not. There's still a back door. There's still... There's, you still got some boats sitting on the shoreline that you can escape from. But once you st start deciding, then it's done. What you decide is done. All change happens in an instant. How fast? An instant. The moment you decide. The moment you do what? Decide. If you're indecisive, you, if you're hanging out with someone who's indecisive, I mean... Uh, B had that experience. She had a, a double-minded man that was unstable, and she's a decided person. She's like, I'm in, I'm in, and she's assuming her mirror is the same way, but it wasn't. It was a very double-minded, indecisive person who's like, no, 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 and uh, you know, she wasn't fully privy and aware, privy to that and aware of that, but that was all part of the plan, so now that she, from this moment forward, she's like, okay, I'm only going to hang out with decisive people, or I'm only going to, you know, I'm only going to go, going to go onto the field with the size of people. Now, never again I'll be standing on the field with some half-asser that I'm trusting with my back, and then all of a sudden, so, like, something happens way off in the distance. They talk, take off running, and I'm like, where'd they go? And now my back's open. I'm not going on the field with those people anymore. Right? B? See? She got wisdom now. I said, so it's not a mess. It's a message. She can say, uh, hey, women. Y'all don't, don't be dealing with indecisive men. Because that leads to de division, multiple visions. Divisions, multiple visions, which leads to div divorce. Multiple visions are going to split ways at some point. Uh, yeah, you can't spell decide without die. Decision means the death of all other options and the part of yourself that wanted those things in the first place. Not just the options, it's, that, it's the, the dysfunctional aspect of you, the identity that you were living as, that that was a perfect mirror to, the undecided part of you. Stop being an indecisive, double-minded person. That's why you're dealing with indecisive, un, uh, un, double-minded people, is because there's a part of you that's still indecisive, double-minded, which means... There's not, the atonement has not occurred yet. You have not decided yet. Your mirror is reflecting back to your, your lack of indecision. So decide. Decide means to die. Cut it all off. John 12, truly, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it. But whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be as well. You've got to lay it. It's an it's a all or nothing thing. You can't 99% Jesus. When Jesus says, follow me, he goes and he's like, lay it all down. Like, like instantly. Can I, go, can I go bury my dad? Let the dead bury their dead. Can I go say bye? No. This is a, this is a decision. There's, you're cutting off from all their options. That's not you anymore. That's who you're not. You hate your family, hate your children, hate your life, all of it. You're with me now. It's, it, it's an, and it's a monogamous relationship, not a 99%. And all those little pleasures of your flesh that you still want to hold on to, all those little dreams and desires that were going to make you feel better about yourself because you're so successful and you got to do all the things that you get to do in this life, all that stuff, if, you follow, if you're holding on to any of that, that's the degree in which you still have not died with him. 
And if you have not died with him, then you will not resurrect with him. You will die with the rest of the dead people. It's an all-in thing. And that's why you got all these Christians that are reading the Bible, saying all the words, but they hadn't died. They're still holding on. They're just using it so they can do what they already did. You know, they'll, they'll use Jesus so they can, uh, they, they look like they're a good person so some people will believe in them. But they're still full of shit. They're still full of shit because they never took responsibility for the shit to cough it up and get it out and go and sin no more, to let it go completely. So, um, so people think there's something that the next blessing is going to give them, not realizing that the blessing they're waiting for is just more of an awareness of who they truly are. That's all you're actually waiting for, just an awareness of who you truly are. You don't want another blessing. You don't want the thing. You don't want the thing. You want what you think the thing will give you. But what you truly, all you actually want, the, the, the actual blessing is to have more of an awareness of who you truly are beneath who you're not that you keep adding to. But the only way to know who you truly are is to know whose you truly are. And that comes from the decision. I'm not a child of Satan, not a child of this world. I'm a child of God. And I give my whole life to him. My what life? My whole life. All of it. All of it. Put it all on the altar. Every teeny tiny little piece. All of it. It all goes on the altar. May you find a purpose valuable enough to get your heart broken over and over for until the egoic separate self-construct that was born in sin gets broken open completely and all that's left is the love that created you. There's no such thing as a broken heart, only broken expectations. There's no way to... So your, your egoic construct, your separate self, the thing that does not want to die, that thing is dead already. So the part of you that does not want to die... This wanting to hold on to things in this world, all your past things, all your little memories from all the past things of who you're not, all that, everything that you're holding on to, the one who's holding on to it is dead already because that's not you. That never was. It's dead already. And so uh, that egoic construct can't, can, it can't be broken without a purpose given to you by God coming through you that's more important than it and, and all of its things, than that ego, than its life. It doesn't have a life because it's dead already, but it thinks it has a life. So there has to be a purpose in you that's bigger than what that thing wants, than that, than that thing's life. And so when you have that purpose and you will go for it, your heart's going to get broken over and over, but it's not actually broken heart. It's a broken expectation. It's the broken expectation of that, that uh, illusory identity, that egoic separate self-identity that was compartmentalizing love and wanting things in order to be able to control love, putting love in packages and, aha, I got this package, so I now I have love, but so uh, now I don't have to feel like I'm not enough. But that thing that feels like it's not enough is not enough and never will be because it doesn't even exist. So the purpose that God gives you that he created you for in the first place, that's got to come through you. And then as you, and you follow that, it's got to matter to you. God's purpose for you has to matter to you more than anything that he's ever given you or that anyone has ever given you, including the life that he gave you. That purpose that he gives you has to be more important than the life that he gave you. Otherwise, you're going to hold on and... You're, but the thing that's holding on is dead already. It's your egoic separate self-identity that, that s- still perceives itself as separate from God. So um, you can't break your ego and come to the awareness of who you truly are by faith alone. It takes commitment to a purpose. Faith alone isn't, isn't, doesn't cut it. It takes commitment to a purpose. James 2 uh, 14 through 26. What, it, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. 
You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without works is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his, that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. You can't just read some words and say some things. Your walk has to be your talk. First, you need to be talking God talk. And then second, you need to be walking God walk. You can't just show up to church on Sunday and put your nice suit on and read the words and then regurgitate them and think it's done. That's not it. Your life becomes an entire walk of God, all of it, or else it ain't any of it. It's all all or nothing. I would say it's all or nothing. So there's no point in talking it if you're not walking it. Then you're just another religious person who's cleaning the outside of your cup, leaning the inside dirty. It's, It's time to be done with dirty innards. I don't care if my outers are dirty, if I'm getting work on my innards. Because as I'm cleaning up my, my innards, all what I'm doing to clean it is cleaning out on the outside, and I don't, I don't even care what it looks like on the outside. So the formula for life is spirit inside of a body. Faith is spirit, works is the body. And so we were literally created to bring heaven to earth. So spirit, body, faith, and works coming together. This is our sole purpose. The whole reason he created creation and then created the creatures was to give the creation and creatures to the creators, which are us. And the whole purpose he created the creators was to give expression to heaven. And we are the kings and the queens to bring heaven to earth. So now there's a form for heaven to flow into. And we are the, we are the conduits. We are the messengers. And heaven is the message. So faith faith is the currency of heaven. As long as you stay in faith, you'll make mistakes, but you'll never be a mistake. You're going to do it wrong along the journey, wrong, and you'll make a mistake, but as long as you stay in faith, see, if you you move into fear, then you become a mistake. You made a mistake, and then you identify with the mistake, which is just a time-based moment, and now you've become a mistake. But as long as you stay in faith, you just keep walking. You walk through. You walk through the mistakes. You walk through the messes. Until it's just a, just over, you're overflowing with messages. It's just pouring out so many messages for all the, all the humanity that's, that's behind you. When you walk through with faith, you just, okay, I messed up. But you get right back up and I messed up, but I'm, I'm not a mess. I'm a message. And you just, the message is I can get back up and keep going. And you just keep back up, get back going. And then you got all these messages for all the people that don't think it's, they don't have faith. All they got is doubt and fear because there's no way through this. There's plenty of ways through this. I've been through all that. So none of y'all have anything to say to me about anything because I've already been through it. You just, so because I have faith and works. I don't just have faith. I have faith and works. That's why I'm such a big presence in this world because I have faith and I have the works to back it up. And then those works become messages for the people that don't have faith because it looks too big what they're up against. But what you're up against is just your ego. And you can do that. You can transcend that. So, um, as long as you stay in faith, you'll make mistakes, but you'll never be a mistake. If you plant doubt, you open the door to fear. And once you have fear, you can't flow in faith. You know, I was watching this movie, Star Trek, Into Darkness the other day. And um, there was this moment. It was an impossible moment where there's no way out. There's no win. It's like, it's a, lose, it's a full-on lose-lose scenario. And there's nothing anyone can do. But Captain Kirk says, he, he's, he goes and does something that does not make any sense whatsoever. But there's no other option. I mean, it's, it's, we're dying anyway. Why don't I just go ahead and give it, another, give it a shot to do this thing? Yeah, we're most likely going to end in death on this one. Yeah, this is, this is a bad idea. And what he says is, um, 
I don't know what I'm doing, but I know what I can do. And this is the only thing that can do. And so I'm going to do that. Y'all can just sit there and stew in your misery and your doubt and let your fear block your flow, but I'm going to stay in flow. I'm not going to let fear stop me. This is the only way, this is the only place my faith can flow right now. So this is the only action that I can take so faith can stay alive. Because faith does not stay alive without action. With no action, there is no faith. Faith dies without action. So faith moves into form. And so this is the only step that I can take right now, so I'm taking it. Even though it looks bad, it's better than faith dying. Like Braveheart, yeah, the same thing. It's extraordinary, yeah, I'm going. Doesn't make any sense, but I'm going. Yeah, yeah, what'll happen if I, what'll happen if I don't? Nothing, yeah, well, that's the point. Something's got to happen because uh, love is, is life. Life is infinite expression and creation. It's gonna, it's, it keeps growing and flowing. Don't cut it off. Don't cut off life. We can never know what we're doing. If we know what we're doing, then what we're doing is, is not actually the highest and best thing because can't solve a problem at the level of consciousness that created it. We're not the message. We're the messenger. And being the messenger is the message. When you realize that I'm, I'm, I'm just a messenger, I'm just a conduit. When you do that, now you've become the message because the message is you're all just messengers too. You're all just conduits too. You're just messengers of God here to, sh- tell, to show everybody, I got a message, everybody. God's on the throne. God's on the throne. That's the message. And as you become a conduit for God, not my will but thine be done, and God's going to use you and... and and the impossible becomes possible. Uh, impossible. I was thinking about, I just laughed because one of my shorts um, from, a, from a few weeks back, I was doing a little 60 second shorts and, I, and it was from a, a sermon I did a few weeks back and it says, uh, Im- impossible, impossible literally says I'm po- possible, but uh, re- no, so responsibility is taking res- res- a- ability to respond to reality and respond it means there's, a, there's a, a space between stimulus and response. In that space, that's your responsibility. You, you take that moment to be present to the present of the present and pause for the cause. And so when you pause for impossible, there's a little pause for the cause right there. When you put a little pause for it, it becomes I'm possible. And that little pause for you, that little pause for the cause right there, that little space, that little pause for you, that's Jesus. <laughs> that's Jesus right there. He turns the impossible to I'm possible. Bam, right there. So uh, we can never know what, uh, what we're doing if we're, because if you know what you're doing, then what you're doing is not the highest and best because what you, if you know what you're doing, you just know what's already been done. But God's got a higher, higher, he's got a higher perspective than you do. So if you know what you're doing, that's a, that's a big sign you need to get out of the way. Stop, do it. Whatever you're doing, don't do that. Let go of knowing. Get in your heart and let God use you to do something bigger than you know what you can do. So, um, a prepared messenger is better than a prepared message. It's not about the message. It's about the messenger. The messenger is the conduit for the message. But if you're wor- so worried about getting it right, that's the dead letter that's killing. Don't worry about the message. Just be prepared. So how to be a prepared messenger? The answer is to become someone who doesn't need to know what to do because you know how to be done. Prepared messenger never knows what to do. They know how to be done. Not my will but thine be done. How, a prepared messenger knows how to be done by God. They know how to get out of the way and let God use you. That's a prepared messenger. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it but I know how to be done. I know how to get out of the way and let, let God use me. And that's a prepared messenger and that's what's most important. Uh, how to, so when you're being a prepared messenger, you're going to be coming from peace. How do you come from peace? You identify as a creator. You are a creator. But say, I'm a creator. So I always you know, say the, the best way to predict the future is to create it. You are creating your own future. And so, uh, by, I, so you can be at peace when you identify as a creator. Oh, whatever it is is coming. My mirror is just reflecting back to me whatever's going on inside of me. Don't get what I want or deserve. I get what I focus on. So am I fo- focusing on f- 
fear and doubt or faith and love? Okay, I'm going over faith and love. Okay, cool. Now I'm in perfect peace. So you identify as a creator and then you love your creation. Once you realize, oh, I'm a creator, then you love your creation because if you reject your creation, you reject yourself. And so everything that you've ever experienced in your entire life that was not something that you absolutely loved, you made that up. And so own that. Wow, look, I created a world that was actually opposite of God's world, which means, wow, what a creator I am, because God is pure peace, love, joy, abundance, all, all, the, all the goodness, yet somehow I made a world that is opposite of his world, which means I must be a powerful creator. So own that you're a creator, and then own your creation. Love your creation. Like, well, okay, look at that. I owned all, look at that. That's pretty wild that I can create something so different from God. I truly am a creator. So own your creation and how you own it is you celebrate everything. Just celebrate it all. Celebrate life. Celebrate the ups. Celebrate the downs. Just celebrate it all as, you know, as the Bible says, rejoice in all these things and everything, whether it's good or bad, rejoice in all of it. Count it all good. Count it all God. So, uh, so be at peace. You come from peace. And then, uh, trust. Where does trust some come from? Trust comes from being someone who can be trusted. How do you become someone who can be trusted? You honor your word. You stop being double-minded. You decide. You have integrity. You decide. And then whenever you decide, you let your word become flesh. You, you, you honor your word. And then when you're someone who can be trusted, then you trust. The only reason you don't trust anyone or anything is because you can't be trusted. If you're ever not trusting, it's because you can't be trusted. The reason you can't be trusted is because you don't trust yourself. The reason you don't trust yourself is because you don't honor your word. You don't decide. You're double-minded, and you don't do what you say you're going to do. I, uh, way back when, um, I, uh, so that's another thing. I, so I had the gift of faith, but I've also got the gift of truth. God already, like, as far as um, telling the truth, I've, like, God gave me both of those. Even when I was a broke, ignorant, blackout, drunk, atheist, beach bum, I, that, that faith was still in me, but also I always told the truth. Uh, I, my whole life I've, I've been like that. And so even back then, I remember when I got very successful in real estate investing, I was this, my mentor, Dean Graziosi, he'd had me come up on a live, live cast with thousands and thousands of people to tell my story. And as I was telling my story, all of these uh, people started asking these, this question. They kept asking the same question. And I, I kept talking about all this other stuff, but they just, they asked me about something that I like, I had no idea that was even a thing. And they kept asking me, how did you get your private lenders? And what? And you're getting like, people are giving money, not even signing any documents or anything like that. How did you do that? I'm like, I don't know. Like it, it was never, it was, I was unconsciously competent around it. I didn't know how that was happening. But now looking back, I realize how it was happening because, because I trust, because I trust, I trust, because I trust, then people can feel that. But the reason I trust so much is because I trust myself. The reason I trust myself is because I do what I say I'm going to do. I've always done that. I've never been a liar. And so, I mean, I've lied, but I've never been a liar. <laughs> There's a few things popped out, but I've never, like whenever, I, if it was something that I said I was going to do, I always did what I said I was going to do. And so why people were just giving me money, like even when I didn't know, we're out of the gates, not even knowing what I'm doing really, is because I always did what I said I was going to do. Like the first person who loaned me money, it was my boss that I'd worked for for 10 years. And even though I was, I'd get blackout drunk, I'd be all hopped up on cocaine all night till four in the morning. I'd still be at work at 9 a.m. every single day. I was on that boat. I'd be, I might be throwing up as I'm driving the boat. I'm like throwing, uh, I, I might be, I, and I would literally be throwing up off the side of the boat. I'd be f driving the Periscope boat, flying rides, people up in the air, and I'm laying over the side puking. But I was there every day, <laughs> and I always did what I said I was going to do. I always got it done, and so he could depend on me. So whenever I uh, at, bought, wanted, needed money to borrow to start real estate investing, he's like, Psh, I already know you're going to pay it back because I also had paid off somebody else's debt because there was a guy that was in trouble. He's like, I can get your friend out of trouble, but it's going to cost 25 grand. And I said, well, I'll pay the guy. Uh, well, no, he said, if the, I trust you, but I don't trust him. So if he doesn't pay, will you pay me? And so I vouched for the dude and the dude didn't pay. But guess what I did? I spent the next entire year 
just my whole, it was 25 grand. I didn't even get, I didn't even make any money because my whole year of working seven days a week was all to just pay off my friend's debt because I said that I would. And so when it was, and that was like, I think like two years before I started real estate investing. And so it was all part of the plan. But so by the time I'm starting real estate investing, I'm like, here's what I'm going to do. Well, this dude, my, the, my old boss was like, well, I know you're going to pay because you don't just pay your debts. You pay other people's debts if you say you're going to. So I know you're going to be that. So because I'm someone who can be trusted and because I know that, people know that. My mirror reflects that back to me. So you've got to be coming from peace. You've got to trust and you've got to have a vision because without vision, the people perish. You have to know where you're going because if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You've got to have that vision and stay clear because that's, the, that's where the faith is coming. The faith is coming from you standing in the vision of the, that you're already in it. It's already done. So no longer being, you're no longer being conformed to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And now the world is not affecting you. You're affecting it because you know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, this world's going to come in and suck you into all the lies and illusions and everything. So when you got peace, when you got trust, when you got vision, you are a prepared messenger. So once you're prepared messenger, though, watch out for and celebrate flying monkeys because they will come. There will be flying monkeys. Also look out for hyenas. There's going to be hyenas circling around you. There's going to be people that can see the faith in you. Uh, you know, yes, again, that's like a guy that we had here not too long ago. The guy talked a big faith. He talked a big talk, but he didn't walk a big walk. But when he saw a big walker, he could see my faith was much bigger than his. And so he became this hyena that was circling around and he was trying to, he just wanted to eat off the dead carcasses that I was leaving behind. That's like, you know, it's just like, because he didn't have, he doesn't even know how to walk in, into a vision, but he saw somebody who could. So you're going to start having hyenas start to circle around you because even if, um, because if the hyenas are there, that means you're sitting on a gold mine. And even if you don't even know it yet, they already do. The hyenas already know. And they're like, okay, they're, cause they're used to just, they're used to finding people in faith with visions and hopping on that, on that train, hopping on to go find and just, you know, that's what hyenas do. And so when you get the hyenas start circling around, you really, so the flying monkeys are going to come first. And then you're going to, you know, as you transcend the flying monkeys, now you're, now you've really, you've passed the test. You're prepared for a prom, the, the, you're, you're being prepared for your promotion. you there's the uh, uh, anointing and the appointing. So you got anointed, you faced the flying monkeys and now you're being appointed. And then once the hyenas start circling around, that's when you really, okay, now you're sitting on something. So be watching for those. Uh, okay, let's, uh, all right, we're, we're going to do A Course in Miracles now. So, all right, let's all, let's all do the, say the thing again. Everybody say, this is the at-one-ment. And we say, when would now be a good time? And we say, now is the time. And we say, this is my moment. And we say, this is my atonement. All right, so I'm going to read from A Course in Miracles, which is coming from the atonement. A Course in Mir Miracles is coming from atonement. This is coming from... Uh, the eternal life of Jesus, the, the, but it, it's, it's time for us to start stepping into it and receiving it. Instead of just talking about it off in the future, it's time for humanity to actually start to receive what the whole point of the Bible is. Instead of just like reading the Bible and then when we die one day, then we're going to go to heaven. Well, the whole point of the Bible, what Jesus said, on earth as it is in heaven, establishing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's the whole point of it. It's not about going there. It's, bringing, it's about bringing it down here. The kingdom of God is within you, and you are meant to bring it here. That's the whole point, and that's the atonement. So, uh, so who's ready for the atonement? Say, I am. I am. Okay, so this is Jesus. He says, I am in charge of the process of atonement, which I undertook to begin. When you offer a miracle to any of my brothers, you do it to yourself and me. The reason you come before me that I do not need miracles, or the reason you come before me is that I do not need miracles for my own atonement, but I stand at the end in case you fa fail temporarily. And so I'm, I'm with Jesus in the atonement now. So John, John you're seeing this body but this body, but this, the spirit that is animating this body is chilling with Jesus, hanging out in the atonement. So uh, he's using me 
as like, like uh, you know, if you're sitting at the top of a mountain and there's a bunch of people that are trying to come up the mountain and you're like, hey, you know, watch out for that stick down there, that hole right there, they can't hear you. So there's like, imagine though, like a whole chain of people that are all holding hands you know, going down the mountain, right? And so Jesus is sitting up at the top of the mountain and like he's, I'm holding his hand. He's standing there. So because I'm holding his hand, I'm, I'm with him in the atonement at the top of the mountain and I'm, I'm anchored off into it. But now he's got me reaching out so I can reach further to people that are further, further away from the atonement that haven't received him yet. And so he's using me as like a bridge to the bridge. And so, but he's talking about right now, uh, about, yeah, he is that, he is that bridge. He says, um, I, I stand at the end in case you fail temporarily. And so I'm standing at the end with him as well. I see what he sees. I think how he thinks. I, I perceive you the way that he perceives you in the atonement. And so that's what's about to be distinguished right here. So my part in the atonement is the canceling out of, of all errors that you could not otherwise correct. So Jesus' purpose in the atonement is to cancel out all the errors that you could not otherwise correct because you can't see the picture when you're inside of it. And what you believe to be true is true for you, even if it's bullshit. But since you're living inside of your truth, you don't know what's out. You don't know the truth that's outside of your truth because your truth is the truth for you. And so Jesus is standing outside of your truth in the truth, which yours is a miscreation of a bunch of errors. And so he stands outside of it so that he can reach in and help you see what you can't see from where you're standing. Does that all make sense right now? So my part of the atonement is the canceling out of all errors that you could not otherwise correct. When you have been restored to the recognition of your original state, you naturally become part of the atonement yourself. As you share my unwillingness to accept error in yourself and others, you must join the crusade to correct it. Listen to my voice. Learn to undo error and act to correct it. Now notice he's just saying you're undoing error, the illusion. You're not, like that's all he's doing. He's like, Jesus didn't die for our sins. He lives for our innocence. He lives for our, because he's alive, we are too, and be, he sees our, our purity underneath all the, the egoic separate self. So all he is doing is undoing our, our miscreations, our errors, our errors in perception. Sin is not an action to be punished. It's a perception to be corrected. We perceive ourselves to be disconnected from God. We perceive ourselves to be someone and something that we're not. We perceive ourselves to be children of time that, that screwed up and there's no way home. But as you receive the atonement, you'll realize not only you're right, there is no way home because you're home already, but you just couldn't see that because you were living in a perceived separation. So he is that correction of error that you can't correct for yourself because you've, you've, you're living inside, you can't solve a problem at the level of consciousness that created it. So you need him to take the final step for you. And then he'll use you to assist others. Like he uses me to assist others in bringing them out. But it's him doing it through me. So um, when you have been restored to the recognition, notice he said restored to the recognition of your original state. So you're just recognizing that it was here now, always has been, always will be. When you are restored to the recognition of your original state, you naturally become part of the atonement yourself. So the atonement is the at one We are all one and we are starting to remember that. And so as you wake up to your original state, now you're a part of the atonement. So you start remembering inside of others who they are underneath who they think, that, who, who they think they are, but they're really not. And you don't let who they're not convince you that that's who they are. Is everybody following right now? So, um, you share my unwillingness to accept error in yourself and others. You must join the great crusade to correct it. Listen to my voice. Learn to undo error and act to correct it. The power to work miracles belongs to you. I will provide the opportunities to do them, but you must be ready and willing. Doing them will bring conviction in the ability because conviction comes through accomplishment. The ability to... The ability is the potential, the achievement is its expression, and the atonement, which is the natural profession of the children of God, is the purpose. So the atonement is the natural profession of the children of God. This is, what, this is our job. The, the, the job of the children of God is the atonement, the atonement. 
So, and that is the purpose. Heaven and earth shall pass away means that they will not continue to exist as separate states. My word, which is the resurrection and the life, shall not pass away because life is eternal. You are the work of God, and his work is wholly lovable and wholly loving. This is how a man must think of himself in his heart, because this is what he is. The forgiven are the means of the atonement. Being filled with spirit, they forgive in return. Those who are released must join in releasing their brothers, for this is the plan of the atonement. Miracles are the way in which minds that serve the Holy Spirit unite with me for the salvation or release of all of God's creations. I am the only one who can perform miracles indiscriminately because I am the atonement. You have a role in the atonement, which I will dictate to you. Ask me which miracles you should perform. This spares you needless effort because you will be acting under direct communication. The impersonal nature of the miracle is an essential essential ingredient because it enables me to direct its application. And under my guidance, miracles lead to the highly personal experience of revelation. So the miracles are impersonal. They have to be impersonal because otherwise you'd have a bias. You'd have a a, a, a preference and you'd get in the way. And and it'd be, it, significance would get in the place of service. And so the impersonal of the nature, uh, nature of the miracle, it's not, a per, it's not personal. Don't get off on a miracle. Not on you giving a miracle or you receiving a miracle. Don't get off on them. They're not personal. It's universal for everyone. And so that's important because it enables him to direct his application. And under his guidance, miracles lead to the highly personal experience of revelation. The revelation that you receive for the miracle that is highly personal. That's a unique experience and expression because each of us are, you know, we're all members of the body of God, but each member is, is got a different role in a different place. So it's, it's a personal experience, a personal revelation that the finger gets different from the personal revelation than this, the left thumb gets. Personal experience is very, very personal. The revelation is. And, but, but the miracle itself, it's impersonal. It's no big deal. Uh, where are we at? A guide does not control, but he does direct, leaving it up to you to follow. Lead us not into temptation means recognize your errors and choose to abandon them by following my guidance. Error cannot really threaten truth, which can always withstand it. Only error is actually vulnerable. You are free to establish your kingdom where you see fit, but the right choice is inevitable if you remember this. Spirit is in a state of grace forever. Your reality is only spirit. Therefore, you are in a state of grace forever. That's the atonement. It's the remembering of the truth that is true, was true, will be true always. That's the atonement. Um, One, two. I got five more paragraphs and then we'll be done. Atonement undoes all errors in this respect and thus uproots the source of fear. Whenever you experience God's reassurances as threat, it is always because you are defending misplaced or misdirected loyalty. When you project this to others, you imprison them, but only to the extent which you reinforce errors they have already made. So I'll say that again because there's a nuance right there that's important. It says, um, uh, when you project this to others, you imprison them, but only to the extent which you reinforce errors they already have made. So you can't actually imprison someone, but you, you can be used to reinforce the lie that's already in their eye. And therefore, they're imprisoning themselves and using you to do it. And so on your side, you, you know, you're imprisoning them, but you're also imprisoning, you, if you're imprisoning anyone else, you're also imprisoning yourself. So... Uh, but if you're freeing anyone else, you're also freeing yourself. And how you free others by freeing yourself. Once you're already free, then you're going to see everyone else is free, even when they don't see it. And they'll fight for their lies. They'll do everything they can to sell their lies to you and make their lies more real than real. But don't fall for it. You just stay in the truth. Uh, so this makes them vulnerable to the distortions of others, since their own perception of themselves is distorted. The miracle worker can only bless them, and this undoes their distortion and frees them from prison. 
You respond to what you perceive, and as you perceive, so shall you behave. The golden rule asks you do unto others as you would have them do to you. This means that the perception of both must be accurate. The golden rule is the rule for appropriate behavior. You cannot behave appropriately unless you perceive correctly. I used to think that that behaving appropriately was unconditionally loving people, which was no matter what they do, just love them anyway. Uh, And yes, it is true to love them anyway, but love in action is confronting dysfunction. So if they're dysfunctional, it's confronting it. So because I was still in a false perspective of what love was, I couldn't appropriately behave to perceive anyone else's perception because, or to, to uh, correct someone else's perception because I was, I was just reinforcing it by seeing them as victims and seeing them as small and seeing them as, you know, seeing them as not being able to handle the truth. The truth is in them. And so you just tell them the truth and it awakens the truth. And they, the one who, that you are afraid can't handle the truth can't handle the truth. But the one you're afraid can't handle the truth is not who they are. So stop relating to who they're not and start relating to who they are. Who they are is the truth inside, not the one that's going to die when you tell the truth that's going to pierce and penetrate and break open the lies that they've been living as. So the truth pierces like a double-edged sword and it separates the wheat from the chaff. It separates who they're not from who they are. So... You cannot behave appropriately unless you perceive correctly. Since you and your neighbor are equal members of one family, as you perceive both, you will do to both. You should look out from the perception of your own holiness to the holiness of others. Miracles arise from a mind that is ready for them. By being united, this mind goes out to everyone, even without the awareness of the miracle worker himself. The impersonal nature of miracles is because the atonement itself is one uniting all creations with their creator as an expression of what you truly are. The miracle places the mind in a state of grace. The mind then naturally welcomes the host within and the stranger without. When you bring in the stranger, he becomes your brother. That the miracle may have effects on your brothers that you may not recognize is not your concern. The miracle will always bless you. Miracles you are not asked to perform have not lost their value. They are still expressions of your own state of grace, but the action aspect of the miracle should be controlled by me because of my complete awareness of the whole plan. The impersonal nature of miracle-mindedness ensures your grace, but only I am in position to know where they can be bestowed. Miracles are selective only in the sense that they are directed towards those who can use them for themselves. Since this makes it inevitable that they will extend them to others. A strong chain of atonement is welded. However, this selectivity takes no account of the magnitude of the miracle itself because the concept of size exists on a plane that is itself unreal. Since the miracle aims at restoring the awareness of reality, it would not be useful if it were bound by laws that govern the error it aims to correct. That is it. That is the completion of the atonement. All that makes absolute perfect sense to me. Uh, to, I, I am, to where you are still perceiving yourself in reality, I don't know how much of that is 100% uh, your reality, but at the very least, you have received seeds that are going to sprout and perpetuate the peace within and without for yourself. So um, will end how we began. Who here has ever had an extraordinary moment in time that was so amazing that you hoped it would never end? Who here would like for every moment to be like that moment? Say, I. I want to say, this is the at one moment. I want to say, when would now be a good time? I want to say, now is the time. I want to say, this is my moment. I want to say, this is my atonement. I would say this is our atonement. I would say this is our one moment. I would close your eyes, take a deep breath in. Let's pray. God, thank you for this one moment, this never ending now, this infinite, pure, perfect, eternal now, this pure heaven that's here now, always has been, and always will be. It's the difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it. We're ready to receive it now. We weren't ready to receive it because we perceived it to be a future thing. But the future and the past 
in the present or all now. That's all there is. All there is is this moment. And in this moment, we are infinitely perfectly connected with God, infinitely perfectly connected with love. We always have been and we always will be. We just forgot. We lived inside of lies and lies lived, in, lies lived inside of us. We created an identity around that and lived as that identity or died as that identity. But thank you for remembering the truth that transcends all of our errors and all of our lies. Thank you for being the truth that never changes. And even when we get so lost inside of what we believe to be true, we never get so lost that we can't be found. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for knowing where we are. Thank you for going all the way into the darkness, taking on all the sins of humanity, all the false perspectives and perceptions, because there was no way we could ever find you, because we were lost inside of our own lives, and there was no way out. So thank you for coming into and through all of our lives, so that you know every nook and cranny and corner of the darkness and the lies that don't exist, but we believe to be true. Thank you for taking it all on and going into hell and taking the keys and unlocking all the prisons and all the cages and setting the captives free. Free from our own minds, our own sin, our own false perspectives. Thank you for taking on all the false perspectives, all the separation, all the disintegration. Thank you for taking it all all on so you would know that there's no spot that love is not, and no matter how far we get lost inside of our lives, the light is still in there because you're, you're there. Thank you for being that truth. We couldn't found, find you, but thank you for finding us. Thank you for being outside the prison, outside the cage, and looking at it from every direction, every angle, seeing at it as the lie that it is, and then entering into it, into every single corner, every single hole, every single cave. Thank you for entering in and turning on the light. This is the moment. Jesus Christ, I receive you in my heart and I receive you in my head, my mind, my emotions, my soul. I receive your spirit. Holy Spirit, I receive you. Holy Spirit, thank you for correcting my perception, restoring me to right-mindedness, restoring me to love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're all one. In this one holy moment, this never-ending, infinite, eternal, pure, perfect, holy moment in heaven. And now it is our role, our purpose, to extend this one moment, to extend this heaven to earth into form, from spirit to form, to bring life into life, to bring faith into form, to bring spirit into body, into Let spirit actually start to matter in these bodies on this earth. Spirit is mattering. On earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Welcome home, everyone. Great job, everyone. I love you all so much. I appreciate you. Uh... We got, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like, share, subscribe, comment. If you're watching live, make sure you go find, the, uh, find my YouTube channel and like, share, subscribe, comment as well. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, go to earthwakingvillage.com and get, find the Awakened Spiritual Gathering. You're going to be able to come here online uh, on Zoom. We do this live every Sunday at 10.30, 10.30 Centered Time. We'll call it Centered Time because it doesn't change. It's Central Standard Time. I know as the old uh, world fluctuates uh, in delusions, going, well, I don't know what time it is. We just stay perfectly present. Uh, centered time, Central Standard Time, 10.30 Central Standard Time, Centered Time. And so it will be like that for moving forward, moving on. So meet us here every 10.30 on Zoom, or you can, if you go to earthbankingvillage.com, you can also find ways to find your way down here, actually, to the village. Um, got in uh, about a month from now, we got our next, off, a little less than a month, we got our next off-grid Dream Life event. That will, if you want to find your way down here, go to offgriddreamlife.com, register for that. I think it's coming up like de- December 4th, so attend that. Uh, other than that, we are a nonprofit for purpose organization. You can, uh, we're, uh, you can make tithes and donations. Just go to bridgebucksbank.com, make donations there. 
And then uh, you can also set up your own account that separates you, takes you out of Babylon and into God's kingdom. Set up your own account. You can start re receiving and giving money tax-free in a tax-free, matrix-free environment. So love to have you in the new earth environment outside of Babylon, the matrix that's crumbling and going crazy out there. Uh, other than that, I think that's it. I love you all. Uh, appreciate you. Who you are. Make, oh, and I'm going to keep it on live for the, for the ones who are here and online. Uh, I'm about to end the recording, so if you're watching on YouTube, you won't see them anymore, but I'll hang out for a few minutes with the people that are live on Zoom and here in person. So, but uh, uh, we'll see you next week. Until then, always remember who you are makes a difference. The world is a much better place because you exist. Thank you for being you. Thank God for you. Thank God for us. And always remember this is that one moment. This is the atonement. And the uh, difference between wanting something and being ready to receive it, when would now be a good time? And we'll say, now is the time. All right, love you guys.